Hello and welcome to another Desk Side Talk with Mark, where I tell you about what games I've been playing lately and what's been on my mind. I played a couple of new games last night that we'll talk about in a bit, and got some other stuff going on today that I would like to talk about, starting off with rule books. Now, the PAX East podcast we recorded a couple of days ago hasn't gone up yet. That'll be next week's podcast, but we did go to PAX East, and I played quite a few games for the first time, often just checking them out at the library and learning the rules from the rule book the old-fashioned way. Now, a lot of people enjoy or prefer going to videos or some other form of learning the rules if there's not someone there who knows the game. But I, I still prefer learning it from the rule book, even if more than occasionally it's a it's a frustrating experience. And while I, I know that writing a rule book has got to be incredibly difficult and that as with most things, it's harder than it looks and I haven't done it before, but I think the number one thing that many rule books miss when they're trying to explain the game is to give you some kind of actual context for what's going on. And I saw this time and time again, looking over rules, trying to learn games that go oftentimes very well, step by step through the setup, through the turn structure, but nothing had any context. So while it may say on your turn, you can do this, this, or this action, I had no idea what the impact was of those actions or why one would take those actions. Just a simple explanatory sentence in there saying you can do this action in order to do X would have made things much simpler because the people writing the rule book know the scope of the game. They know general strategies. They know the game, you know, usually better than anyone else in the world. And so they don't understand that someone going in blind doesn't necessarily know what anything is about in, in relation to each other. So while it's fine to say you have one of five actions, it doesn't become apparent until later that perhaps one or two of those actions are are fundamentally different than the others. Or maybe one of them is kind of a throwaway action that you're not going to use except in an emergency. Or some of them, some of the rule books I saw have spent half the rule book just explaining to you generalized concepts without explaining why they're important at all. And I guess that's one way to solve this problem that I've complaining about before but then you don't have any context for why you need to know that information. I think the rule book for London, when I reread that, it was my second time playing, so I kind of knew what was going on, but the rule book made things much more confusing because you didn't even get into playing the game until you were halfway through the rule book because all these general concepts of what the cards do. I think a good rule book integrates those ideas together where it explains the structure of the game, but it explains why you're doing things and the concepts around that structure all in the same place. And that's so hard to do, but I see so few games doing it. I think the Viticulture Essential Edition is still the best rule book I've ever read. It was so clear and it's not the simplest game in the world. It's a medium lightweight game without Tuscany, but it was so clear and everything made sense in the context of the game because it explained what you're doing and why you're doing it at the same time in very simple, clear language. The other thing I wanted to rant about with rule books is just rule books basically visually creating a wall of text. And I, I found Fantasy Flight does this all the time. I had a lot of trouble when we pulled out the new Civ game, the new Sid Meier's Civ game on the last day of PAX and reading that because it was just paragraph after paragraph. And yeah, there were bullet points thrown in there, but you need to distinguish your ideas better than just paragraphs of text with the occasional bullet point. I would much rather have it be more staccato with each idea clearly delineated visually on the page. GMT does an okay job at this with their kind of law formatting with sub points and sub sub points uh, and all that. But even then it clearly 
distinguishes each idea, but it doesn't give any weight of importance to any individual idea other than that one is broader or, or yeah, another one's a subset of this other idea. I think a good rule book, especially one covering a fairly complicated game, will have that more staccato bullet point method, but also visually distinguish the important ideas from the tertiary ideas around that. Maybe using italics or a slightly smaller font or, you know, visually boxing out kind of a bullet point of exceptions or, or side cases rather than putting that in the main paragraph body of the text. That way you can communicate the big idea get people to understand that first, and then they can go through all of the other information you might need to do, know as a subset of that idea. Anyway, I've read a lot of rule books and learned a lot of games that way in the last couple of weeks. So those were my thoughts there. If you are a publisher or designer looking to write a rule book, those are the things that I would say are critically missing in most of the rule books I've read recently. On a more positive note, if you remember from a few months ago, I had Michael from Meeple Like Us, a great resource. Uh, he was here on the podcast just this last week. He got on Patreon like I am to try to raise some money to keep his resource going. He specifically does reviews, but mostly accessibility teardowns of different games. He has his basically has this site as a huge project to make games more accessible. I know he is consulting a bit with publishers, but he wants to make sure he keeps going. So if you enjoyed him on the podcast, I think he's a great guy and does a great job, honestly, in better reviews than, than the vast majority of people out there, even though that's not his main focus. I highly encourage you to check out his Patreon, which you can access through his site, Meeple Like Us. Just look that up. Another resource that I hadn't mentioned before, but anyone listening, if you're not aware of this, Stonemeyer Games, if you go to that website, Jamie Stigmeyer writes more than anyone I know in the board game space, just constantly writing in really great information about a publisher's perspective and a designer's perspective on many, many things. And so I don't remember what the post was recently I saw, but it was just wonderful. And it's like his 270th blog post. I think it was about what you need to know before pitching a publisher. It's that kind of great information, the behind the scenes stuff. He has so much information about how to run a Kickstarter. So if you are interested in that topic, or especially if you're looking to design and maybe publish games, Go to Stonemeyer Games, find the blog. It's an absolutely invaluable resource for anyone interested in board games or board game design or board game publishing. Now moving on to the games I played recently. I went to a new meetup last night and played a couple of new games. The first one I played was The Mind, which was a big hit from some convention a little while ago a couple months ago. I don't remember. Maybe at Essen or maybe I thought it was after Essen, but it's essentially a deck of cards one through a hundred. The idea is that everyone is dealt out a certain number of cards and then without speaking or communicating with each other, everyone has to play the cards in ascending order. So if you're on a four person team and everyone has two cards and you're holding the 20, you know, maybe you have the lowest card in the group, but maybe you don't. And so everyone kind of waits there and stares at each other and it, once you become confident that maybe no one else thinks they have the lowest card, maybe then you try throwing out the 20. It was an interesting game. I think it will die off fast in terms of replayability. I did enjoy it. There's a couple other mechanisms thrown in there where you gain lives and you have a certain number of lives where you can make mistakes. But as a casual little party game, it was a fun time. I wish it went up to more people instead of uh, just to four people, I wish the rules to adjust to a higher player count, but I think it was a it was a clever little game, and I enjoyed playing it. I probably won't buy it though, though I think the concept is is amusing. The other game I played, which was even more fun, I thought, was Deep Sea Adventure, which is this game, really cool looking blue game in a little tiny box, and it's a really cool twist on roll and move. 
which is usually a mechanism that, that modern board gamers stay away from. But in this one, it worked really well. What you're doing is everyone's on this submarine and there are little tiles leading out from the submarine. And basically you're trying to collect as many points as you can from picking up those treasure tiles. And so the deeper you go down in the water, the more lucrative those tiles are going to be. But the problem is that once people start picking up treasure, they start losing oxygen and the group has a collective oxygen level. So at some point you want to turn around and start heading back towards the submarine and you can pick stuff up on the back as well. But the problem is each piece of treasure you're holding reduces your movement speed by one. So if you're holding two pieces of treasure and these are on dice that only go up to three a piece. So the maximum you can get is six. You know, if you, as I did many times are holding two to three pieces of treasure and keep rolling twos and threes, you're not going anywhere at all. So a fun little game where you're just trying to push your luck as much as possible. You got to be very careful. I didn't make it back on any of the three rounds. So I was clearly too bold and adventurous. Mostly what happened was I rolled high numbers going down and then rolled really comically low numbers coming back up. It didn't work at all. But for a short little 20 minute game, I'm sure at a low price point, I haven't looked it up, but it's, it's really tiny game you can fit in your pocket. I would recommend it. It was quite fun and looked really cool. The final game I, I didn't play last night, but I got at PAX and managed to get one game of in was Castles of Burgundy, the card game. Now, uh, anyone who's listened to the podcast or read the Thoughtful Gamer at all knows that I love Castles of Burgundy, the board game. It's easily in my top 15, 20 of all time, probably will be there for a long time. And I saw the card game on sale at PAX, so I decided to pick it up. I know that the Dice Tower, I think, said they liked it, or at least Tom, if I remember correctly, said that he liked it better than the board game. And I got one play of it in a, a two-person game, and I don't like it nearly as much, at least based on that one play. There's always an issue with Castles of Burgundy. The board game's a good two-player game. I think it's better at higher player counts, even though it can last longer, just because you see more of the tiles. And especially at two players, you're only going to see about half the tiles, so there's a fair amount of randomness in, for instance, whether or not you're going to finish that set of pigs or whatever you're trying to collect. In the card game, that's... That issue is is escalated so much farther because to, to score anything, really, you have to collect sets of three. And I found in a two-player game, it was very, very difficult and very cutthroat in trying to get those sets of three. And what happened was going into the last round, I had two sets of two sitting there and not one of those two types of cards showed up in the last round just by random chance. I suspect, just like in the board game, this issue diminishes in higher player counts, but it seemed much more severe at the two-player count in the card game than in the board game, which makes it very hard to plan ahead. It is a much lighter game as a result, though it's nearly just as fiddly with all the little piles of cards you're having to deal with. It does play a bit quicker, but it seemed like much more a result of... There was a much more of an issue of, of luck in the card game than in the board game. And I find the board game to be just kind of that perfect balance of a little bit of luck, but the better player is usually going to win. In this game, I think, again, at least at the two-player count, luck seemed dramatically more important. So I'm skeptical. I do want to play it four players to see if it's a lot better there. But right now, this would not be getting my recommendation at all, which was unfortunate because I kind of wanted the card game to be really good. Even though I do love the board game, it would have been really nice if they had managed to squeeze all the goodness of the board game into a shorter, quicker card game with a smaller box. But they certainly didn't do that, and time will tell in a few more plays. will tell if it's even a game worth considering at all, but right now I'm saying no, unfortunately. The last thing I want to mention, this isn't a game, but soon in the one year-ish anniversary of my top 50 games countdown on the podcast, I will be doing 
a top 100 games countdown. I'm bumping it up to 100 games starting in a couple of weeks. And what I'm going to do is probably stream those podcasts. They'll be in the off weeks, just like this one. They won't be part of the, what I consider the main podcast. But I want to try to get more people excited about the podcast and live streaming. I do it for my patrons uh, who support me on Patreon for the main podcast. But for the top 100 countdown podcasts, of which there will be five, I'm going to stream it for the public. So be on the lookout for dates and times of that. It'll probably be in an evening East Coast time, but it'll save on YouTube and I probably will stream it on Twitch, so it'll save on Twitch at least for a couple of weeks. Also, if you want to view it after the fact, the live podcast recordings are a lot of fun. You're guaranteed to get an appearance from my cat who likes to mull around during our recordings and make a bunch of noise, and you'll get to see all the mistakes we make that I have to painstakingly edit out every week, and Matt likes to revel in that, in that he he says fix it in post all the time, and it drives me insane. But I think it's enjoyable to watch. So be on the lookout on social media, particularly Twitter, where I'll be posting information about that. It should be within the next week, week and a half that we'll be doing that live recording. And I hope to see you in the chat watching. That's my desk side talk for this week. Again, next week's podcast, hopefully on Wednesday, will be our PAX East recap where we talked about a wide variety of topics and games, including some games that we really, really loved. So don't miss that. I'll talk to you all soon. Goodbye.